Right. So if you see this, right, yesterday we started this topic a little bit in terms of platform scripting. So this is where we are in terms of our course content. We are here, right? We were supposed to finish it by yesterday, but in CMDB, we had two classes and uh, that got extended. That is why we are doing platform scripting today. I mean, initial overview we had yesterday, and now we'll talk about detailed understanding of that platform script. So if I go back to this, this is what we have studied yesterday, that uh, you have client-side scripts, you have server-side scripts, you have all, all client scripts, UI policies, uh, UI actions, data policies. These are all your client-side things. Server-side things is business rules, the script includes these are server-side things generally. Okay. Now if I, <clears throat> if I go back to the instance, now let's see them one by one. Now I think we also talked about the use cases, for example, when I am on any, any list view, for example, we just, sorry. So I'm on a list view right now. So I think we talked about something yesterday that whatever I see as an action, which I have to take as a button, that is more of a UI action. So all of these actions are called as UI actions here, as well as here at the form level. So we are talking about it right now, we have the form, so we're talking about the form level. All of these are UI actions. All client head actions, right? Even all of these are also UI actions which are coming from context menu. The same context menu can be also visible if I right click on this header. The same thing is visible. So either you go from here or you go from here, it does not really matter. And then you have these related links, all these things. They are also UI actions because if I create, click on this, any of these options, it will take some action, right? This is where. The form level things are there. Now, let's understand how it works on lists. So at a list level, when I do a right click on a record, this is also a UI action. Based on this right click, I am doing so many things. Right? Here also. So overall, what we're trying to say is wherever there is option to click, this is where you and then if I select these options and I want to take some action on selected rows, all of these are UI actions for us. Right? Now let us go back to the concept of uh, maybe let's talk about UI policy. This is where you have UI policies. Now let me just see it on an incident table. What so first of all, let's understand where do you apply UI policies. You apply UI policies, especially when you want to make anything mandatory or you want to make hide a field and you want to make a field hidden or you want to make a field read only. In these three cases, you generally apply UI policies. So there are 11 for incident policies, for example, if I see on the incident table, there are total 11 UI policies out of the box. Okay. Now what we're doing here is just understand this. This says make fields read only on close because now all of your, these scripting things or these uh, you know, policies, whatever we're talking about, they are actually on the business requirements. Now, which means you need to understand the process and why do we need to do that? And if I have to do that, there is a business case that, okay, this is why you have to do this. Then you need to understand that which script should I apply? Should I apply a UI policy? Should I apply a data policy? Should I apply a client script? Should I apply a business rule? Right? All of, all of, should I apply a UI action? So that you will be able to do once you understand all these concepts, what is an UI policy versus a data policy? What is an UI action? What is a client script? What is a business rule? And yesterday we had understood at a high level in terms of overview, how are these different? And in what cases do we apply these things? So we will see them one by one. Now, so this says make fields read only and close. Now, business case for this one is very simple that if there is a record in system which is closed, then you don't need to actually do anything on that record. You should not be allowing any further update on that record if it is closed unless somebody reopens it. So you give an option to reopen it to the customer, to the client, to the user. But other than that, you don't know, you don't do anything else. That's the whole idea. Now, this is at a global uh, scope because we are not talking about a particular application. We are talking about 
at a global level. So as I said, incident problem change, all those ITSL things are, are there by default in all the modules of service now. So, okay, how do we apply this policy? You're saying that table is incident. So what all do you need to kind of uh, define there? That is what we have to understand. So you have to apply it on table called incident, first thing, right? So you can see this here, it always tells you also that, okay, what it is about. So for, for example, you forgot, okay, should I use a UI policy, UI policy or a data policy or transcript? Let me check. So if you go here, it will tell you a clear understanding UI policies change fields on a form based on a set of conditions. Fields on a form. So this is very important. So the moment there is a requirement where somebody is telling you that on this form, I need to change the behavior of a field. If I have this particular condition, then it should click to your mind immediately that, okay, which means he's expect, expecting me to write a UI policy. Now that particular person who is giving a requirement, he might not understand service now. That is why it, he, he will not talk to in that terminology that, okay, okay, write a UI policy. He will just tell you on this condition, make this happen. That is that's just to do, right? So if there is a business analyst who understands service now also, he can tell you, okay, please go and write a UI policy. And this, these are the conditions on these fields. So what it says, use UI policies to show or hide fields. So this is very important. Show or hide fields to make fields mandatory or read only based on these conditions. Those are the three things that we talked about. Mandatory, read only, hidden. If you are supposed to do these three activities on any form for some fields, this is where you use UI policy. You can add as many actions as you want. First, you have to create the policy and then you can have the actions. And as we discussed earlier also that all of these things are applied on a certain condition that you don't want to uh, make all the feeds read only for an incident form, just you know, for, for any case, then there is no purpose to solve here, right? In fact, it will dilute the entire thing of uh, the raising incident. So you will want to do that only when incident is read only, sorry, incident is closed. That is where you want all the fields to be read only. So nobody can change that particular state of the incident. It is already closed now. Now what do you have to do? You have to find out first, which table, which application. So I think most of them we are reading right now global, uh, because if we talk about custom applications or a particular application, we'll have to select that application. We have not yet talked about custom application that will be later here in day later, later on this course, we'll talk about it later on. Otherwise, so general perception is that you should be writing a description, which tells you at a high level itself, that what do you want to achieve? So, in fact, just by reading this, I can understand that they want us to apply a UI policy, which says make fields read only on close. Okay. Now, when, when do they want to apply this? They want to apply this when the incident state is either closed or canceled, because in both the cases, incident should not be, incident should not be uh, edited, right? And so these are the, different actions they have taken on the UI policy that, okay, they are saying that all of these fields, we don't want, all of them are true read only. This is, this is what you see this. These are the actions that you want to say. All the fields in the incident which are visible to the user, they have marked them read only. Right, so there are three options only. One is mandatory, second is visible, third is read only. So only for these three cases, we're supposed to write UI policies. This is where it becomes really important to understand what do we want to do? If I want to write something, for example, you have policy actions. This is where it will ask you, right? On this table, this field, for example, I'm just selecting any field for that matter. Right? Make it mandatory, make it true, also leave it as it is. Visible, same true, false. This one, same true, false. Clear the field value. I mean, you don't want any field value in that case, right? So this is where you write a policy and you define actions on that policy when you write a UI policy. This is where, this is all about UI policies. Now, if you remember, there was one word, one link, which says, convert this to data policy. Okay, convert this to data policy. Now, if you remember, we talked yesterday, the data policy is required for source cases where you want to put those policies, those restrictions, when the data is coming from any source. In case of UI policy, the, the only source is expected is your front-end interface, your user interface. I mean, on this interface, whatever I'm doing, only on that interface, I'm applying a policy. If I am editing any value on incident form, then all, all of that is applicable only when uh, 
I am I am trying to take a direction on this on this UI on this interface. But if I want to ensure that by any means, even from interface, even from web REST web APIs, even from any export import or whatever you want, any further third party action which you're taking on the form, not on the front form from front end side on the back end side, then also you should apply the same policy. Then you'll have to convert this to data policy. This is where the main difference between UI policy and data policy is. These are some interview questions also. And these are the questions even in the exam that this is where they just want to check your knowledge. Do you understand the difference between UI policy and data policy? If they ask you, if I want to make a field read only mandatory and hidden or visible, then what should you apply? Client script, UI policy, business rule, script includes. Answer is UI, UI policy. Example. If I were to make sure that from anywhere the data should not come uh, or should not, um, this policy is applied on all the sources of the data, then I'll convert this to a data policy, which means you have a flexibility here to convert a UI policy into a data policy also. And then once you define this, this is where you define the actions of that policy. All clear on UI policies? Any questions? No. Now let's understand about UI actions. I'm going here, system definition, UI actions, right? Now, all of these things, uh, whatever we have seen, maybe we just see the incident table. Let's see how many buttons are there on the incident table. See, 31 buttons assigned to me. You might have not seen all these buttons because it, they might be visible on a certain condition. For example, if I were to see this one, create a change request, let's understand what this button says. So this is a UI action, which means I'm creating a button called create change request in the context menu the incident. And I'm telling them to do certain things. What I'm trying to do here, I'm saying this is my expectation that I'm creating a change request from where? From the table incident. I think we have talked about orders already in the game. So whatever is lower in number in order, that runs first always in terms of executions. What is action name? They're saying create standard change. Then they select active, show update, client, all of, all of these are normal things that by default there. We don't need to worry about that part, right? Show insert or show update. So generally, sometimes it shows insert. Sometimes it shows, it shows update in this case, right? So this is also a UI action. Now you can see, do I want to show form, form buttons? Do I want to put it in form context menu? Wherever I want to put it, I can put it. And this is a script which they have written. So generally, we as administrators do not write script. Then this is where the condition they're asking that okay, this is the condition that incident state is not closed. And the person who is logged in has a role called ITIL, has a role called change. He has access to write a change record. And you have a field which exists uh, for incident and RFC. And there is right now, there is no such request for change, which is already raised for this particular record. Now, this is where you define the UI actions for a record. Works. So this is this is code. We will not go into uh, we'll not go into code. I'm just telling you, this is where you define the UI actions. Right. This is this is how it is important. If it requires a particular role, you can give the particular role to that person, right? So that's that's okay. <clears throat> so generally, we as an administrator do not create UI actions because generally it requires you to write scripts. So it is generally de done by developer. But you should know that what is a UI action and what what do I what do I mean when I say UI action? Create a UI action. This is what I mean. Right. So there's so many actions created all on so many reports. Okay, on change request, you have a close request approved. All of these are actions which you take on that change record. But it says so progress has changed to implement state. So it must have a lot of course inside it that all of those pre-checks for a change record has been taken care of. And now I can implement this record. Right? So this is what a UI action is all about. But again, as I said, it requires scripting also to be written. And we'll not go much into that area because we don't need to cover that as part of the syllabus. We just need to understand what is an UI action of where all you can define it. So we have talked about it already. It is at a form level, at a list level. Form level, you can have any button, whatever you see on the form is a UI action from context menu, from right click, from related links, wherever you see an action, it is a UI button, UI action for us. So sometimes people tell you, okay, I want to have an UI action called escalate incident on the incident form. When the SLA is breached, for example, this is what a very, uh, a very generic use case would be. Then people might say, okay, either they will say, uh, now this is where people tell us that, okay, do not go beyond out of the box. It is already there. So use that feature, but I'm just giving you a, 
real time example that they can, they can ask you okay just to have a good look and feel i want to have a button called escalate the moment i do an escalation on that particular incident based on the ci selected or based on the service selected it should immediately be assigned to second level of support this is what you can have a custom ui action generally uh, generally to be honest people don't create much ui action so it is not a very very regular phenomenon it is it is very strategic people generally try to use something which is out of the box rather than creating a new ui action right so any questions on the concept of ui action Now let's understand about data policy. So I'm coming here. System policies, data policies. You see this table. Maybe I use incident table here. There are two data policies. It says one says make close info mandatory when resolved. Let's understand this. What? Right. See this. <clears throat> this is interesting stuff. A little bit. Right? It is a data policy. It says table incident. Uh, we are we are taking writing it to incident table. All of these options are uh, by default ticked. Active is clear, right? And uh, now apply to import. So this is where I was telling you the concept, right? The data policy is applied everywhere in the backends, in the backend uh, part also when you import data from somewhere. Now, but you have a flexibility to uncheck this you want to say okay on import sets i don't want to apply this data policy because there might be some reasons that you want to put some historic data and you don't have that field which is mandatory now which was not mandatory in the previous system so you might not have data for that particular field so what will you do because if you apply a data policy on that your your system will not consume that information it will it will reject it will throw an error that okay i cannot have this because this is a mandatory field for me now in this case those are the generic cases where you actually disable this, but ideally speaking, when you're writing a new data policy uh, for something new in system, you should always be checking these options that it should apply to all those cases from wherever it is coming from the backend. Also. One more interesting thing. Do you see this? Use as UI policy on client. We just talked about UI policy, right? Which means that I also expect this behavior make close info mandatory when there's a lot of close. When I am entering data from my web browser on the form, so same thing can happen. So this is the use case, general business use case that in under what situations should you be writing a data policy versus a UI policy. So if the requirement is only limited to the web form, you better write a UI policy. If the requirement is for all the kind of stuff, you should be writing a data policy. That is the whole idea. But then what I'm trying to say here is system gives you enough flexibility. In terms of selecting or deselecting any option, if you do not want that behavior. Right? What it says, make close info mandatory when resolved or closed. So there is a button, uh, there's a field called close up information, which is closed by or closure code or whatever when you when you resolve an incident. It says that if I click on button resolve or close, I in, want to ensure that this close information becomes mandatory, that nobody should be able to close an incident without writing a closure code or closure notes. That whole idea, and that these are very generic use cases. That is why it is already there in out of the box service now. You don't need to even write it. This is already there, right? Now again, the same concept. Under what condition it should run? It should run when I say resolved or closed. It should not be running on any other state because I am not, in, I am not uh, looking for a situation where I just want to make this closure information mandatory even when I the incident is in progress or cancelled, right? I just want to ensure that it is mandatory only when. I have a state called resolved, or I make a state called closed. Now again, the same concept here. That's, do you see this here? Convert this to UI policy. Now the same situation we had in UI policy where we had a link called convert this to data policy. Do you remember that? Right? So there was a related link in the UI policy which says convert this to data policy. Similarly, you have a link in data policy which says convert this to UI policy. So you have both the options. It is it is both way working, right? Now what it says, the rule, what are the rules we have applied? For difference is in case of UI policies, you are writing actions, UI act policy actions. Here you're writing data policy rules. That is the difference. What it says, this, this field should be mandatory. And this field, close code and close note should be mandatory for this state when the incident is resolved or closed. That is how 
you configure the behavior for a particular form. So the idea we are trying to convey here is with all these client scriptings, client head scripting, you generally control a form or a field level behavior. This is what we have to understand. So whenever there is a requirement for a form or a field level behavior, the first concept is that, okay, I don't need to apply a server side policy. I need to apply a client side policy. Now, among those client side policies, should I be applying a client script? Should I be applying a data policy? Should I be applying a UI policy? That is something we will decide based on the use case. And we have understood the differences between those use cases that, okay, under what situation should we do that, right? But then the first level of demarcation happened itself at that point of time when you said that I want to do this on the form or the field level. So then, then there is no need of server-side scripting in that case, right? Server-side scripting is generally used at a record level when a record is inserted, updated, modified, a query. If you remember, we talked about it yesterday, that any server-side operations, any database-side operations, inserted, updated, uh, deleted or queried. Only in that case, you are supposed to run the server side scripting. Now, we have talked about UI policies, we have talked about UI actions, we have talked about data policies. Any question on data policy you have? If you don't have any question on data policy, then let me move further to client script. Now, this is a little complex thing. That is why I took it towards the end of the client scripting session. So, let's understand this. This is where you might be, in fact, generally write these client scripts when you actually want to do some scripting scenarios. Because if you do not want to do a scripting scenario, then your UI policies, your data policies, UI actions, all of that are sufficient in themselves. Only when you want to some kind of do some kind of scripting, that is where you do this client scripts. I understand this. I'm just trying to see what are the client scripts. There are 26 client scripts already on the incident form, what it says. Oh, most of them are, let me just see the ones which are true. The 20 of them are true. Now what it says, I'm just trying to, okay. I'm saying hide attachment link when closed. Let's, let's understand this kind of policy. So the reason I'm showing you forms because the questions will be asked in forms. And once you see the forms of specific scripts, you understand that what all information will you need from a customer to allow you to configure that particular policy. This is where it becomes all the more important. Why should we look for the form level? Case, okay. So this says hide attachment link when closed on incident form, right? Uh, which means that if an incident is closed, I do not want to show them this particular link. I do not want them to attach anything on a closed incident. Now understand this, how, how does it work? It applies on table incident, UI type. Now this is interesting to understand, right? So you have three interfaces. You, you can have it use a, using desktop, the one I am using right now, desktop or laptop, my normal uh, behavior. You can apply the same concept to mobile, because if you remember, we talked when we talked about service now user interfaces, we said that either it is your normal UI, which we're looking at right now, or it is using mobile, or it is using service portal. So because in service portal, if you have raised an incident for yourself, you are allowed to attach incidents on that, right? So there also didn't want you to attach an incident to a closed record. That is why they are saying that I would apply this policy on all the UI types irrespective of the fact whether it is coming from desktop, laptop, mobile, or service portal. Now, this is where it becomes very interesting. This is the interview question also. This is an uh, exam question also that what types of client scripts do you have? So let's go them one by one. So one is on cell edit, second is on change, third is on load, fourth is on thumb. So few of them are quite self-explanatory from their wording itself. For example, if I say on subject, and when I'm submitting a record or on a form, right? Uh, when I'm submitting a form, I just want to validate whether I have filled in the right information before submitting the form. So on those cases where you want to validate the data on a form before submitting it in the system, you generally use on submit client script. Okay. This is really important to understand, right? If you miss this concept, it will be a problem for you because you will, you will know that I have to write a client script maybe because of the use case. But you need to understand that what kind of client script I'm trying to write. On submit, on load, on change, on solidity, right? When I say on load, 
this is where I am searching the record. And when I'm searching that record, I click on enter and I get in the form. So the moment I get into the form and the form gets loaded completely at that point of time itself, I am saying that I want to apply this client script. Forget about waiting anything from user actually in that case. I'm just saying the moment the form is loaded, for example, you have a certain role, uh, which does not allow you to see some fields in the form or it does not allow you to take some UI action to form. In that case, you say, okay, disable this action, disable this field for this particular person who does not have this role. I mean, for example, disabling a button for approval where the person does not have approval rights. Those are the kind of things which you do when you have to do it on load. When the form is loading, when I clicked on even this one, I clicked on this particular form. It took some time to load the entire form. First of all, this is very important, right? You should always wait for the form to be completed, completely loaded. You should not be in hurry and oh, click, 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 click. No, nothing, nothing. Because sometimes what happens is when the form is not loaded and you make a change in the in during that time, it might have a corrupt behavior, which we should not encourage, right? You should always avoid that kind of behavior. So the idea is this is where your onload scripts are working, wherein you're saying that when the form gets loaded at that time itself, based on the user's rules, restrict this behavior or enable this behavior or a particular field. Uh, I don't want him to write on that field that comes also you can do. So generally, as I said earlier, also at a form level and a field level, this is what we do for all the client scripts, right? Now, when you say on change, what is on change? On change is that I am changing a field. For example, there is a priority field on the internet form. I'm changing it priority one to priority two or priority two to priority one. Right? This is what I'm changing on the field on a form. At that point of time, I want them to take certain actions. For example, display a message that please warning message. Okay. Are you sure you want to change the priority from two to one? Because it will involve uh, multiple communication channels. It will involve multiple escalation channels. Are you sure? So those kind of messages, which will display warning messages or any kind of other messages or anything for that matter, whenever you are changing something you want, for example, I'm changing a value in a field and then I'm uh, trying to uh, fill another field after that, then, then also I can use client script. So idea is whenever the form has been loaded completely and I'm trying to change any value in any of the fields in the form, at that time, I have to apply this client script, which says on change, okay? The last one is on cell edit. <clears throat> and when I talk about on cell edit, this is only applicable for list view. For example, if I, I'll see this script a little later. Let me show you what I'm talking about. For example, if I, if I go here and if I click on here, then if I want to change anything from here, right, this is where you do a cell edit. So cell edit, first of all, is valid for a list view, not a form view. Second, because when you say on change, that was a form. For example, if I were to do anything, if I were to do anything here, I'm, I would change impact agency or category to particularly. For example, if you remember we said, if category is this, assign this ticket to somebody else. So assignment rule, we have something else, but then similarly, you can have some behavior that, okay, if service is this, maybe priority should be this. Or if short description is this, then I, I want to change it to something else, for example. That was on change, which means you're changing a field on the form. In case of list edit, you have to change something here. For example, I'm changing something here. I want to change it to critical. This is the area. He did not allow me to do that because I have restricted this behavior. I should not be able to change priority of an incident from the list view. This is something you do from client scripts and even uh, UI policies, data policies, but yeah, no, not UI policies. I would say, uh, uh, I think generally these kind of things are done, done by using client scripts only. Right. So I was at client script. So this is what is called as on cell edit. I was here client scripts. I was an incident table and I have seen the one which were true. And we were on this one. All right, attachment will be post. 
So I'm allowing the form to completely load it, and then only I'm doing something. Right. Now, what it does on load, it says, now again, they've written a script, which says, okay, if the form value state or incident state is this one, seven or seven, which means, so there are two values in the incident form, incident state and state, both of them are closed. In that case, you are disabling attachment. This is a function they've used for writing, uh, disabling attachments. That is what they're doing here, right? Disable attachments. This is how they've written the script. So generally, in a client, on a client script, you have to write a script. If I'm saying on cell edit, it says field, which field name you want to do this? Because the moment I select on cell edit, which means I'm talking about a particular field here. On which field from the list view you want me to restrict that behavior? I select on change. Then also it talks about field because we are changing value of a field on, on the form, even for on change. On load, you don't need this. On submit, also you don't need this because when you're submitting the record, you're not talking about a certain field, you're talking about the entire record. Right. Again, the application is global, so this is all it is going to happen. Right. This is how this is where you apply. Let us see some just for the use cases that what kind of client scripts do they already have in system, right? So they have something called in certain conditions, they want to have a create child incident on load of the form. Okay, I want to enable this menu of create child incident when the form gets loaded, right? I and I'm just talking about incident table here. I think there are so many tables which are having that right. Empty assigned to on group change. So even this is an on change client script which is uh, working on a group level that, okay, if I change the group of an incident, assigning group of an incident, then assigned to field should be empty. Why? Very simple use case. That earlier, the assigned to person was based on the group. So we, we had the values of group as well as we had the values of assigning. Now, when we're changing the group, I do not know who this incident will be assigned to in terms of the individual. I know the group level, but I do not know the um, the real assigning the individual to whom that incident would be assigned for that particular group. So I will want to make it empty all the time. I choice close. There are some choice fields. You want to just close them on load. So this is where you can just, just review things that, okay, you have, this is on load script. This is something we just thought about on load, on load script, right? This is where we're saying we are setting location of a user when I'm changing the user field, for example, right now the user is XYZ, that is why the location is this. If the user changes, then the location gets changes. That is why it is an on change record. Now, this is where I'm saying close mandatory on close or resolve, right? So those things which said on submit, when I click on resolve, because at, at, the, at that point of time, I'm actually doing a submit record at that time when I do a resolve. So this says that no, you should make sure that the close things are mandatory on a record when you're submitting it. So. This is where you have on, on load, on cell. Let me just see if there is anything for on cell edit. On cell edit. Do I have anything? Okay. So there are cases where you have on, uh, but I just want to see a table which you can understand easily. Well, then the idea is that you have, this is generally, uh, this one says that, for example, uh, I have something here, offering. It says, CSGM check for empty assignment group. So on cell edit. You are editing this record from a list field. Now there is, so it says that, okay, uh, on this table offering, there's a table called offering and service offering section, all, all UI type, on cell edit, which field you want to do on change group. There's a field called change group on this table. If I change that value from the list view, this is what my script tells me. What it tells you, clearing the change group will also clear it on CIs within its dynamic CI groups. Do you wish to continue? This gives me a message. So they said also that, if you want to display a message, you do a warning out of message that also you can do this client script. So this is where it says, right? It is active, active is true. If I want to do something there, it will have this problem. Right? Now, if so we have kind of covered 
I mean, there are there are other planted skills, but again, from a uh, syllabus perspective, I think we just need to focus on UI policies, data policies, UI actions, client scripts. These are all other things. We generally we don't you need to use. We don't need to bother about the syllabus. We use it, but we don't need to bother about the syllabus perspective. The last thing is which is left here is business rules. This is the biggest thing in service now. Most of the intelligence of the system, to be honest works on business rules. <clears throat> if you remember yesterday also we talked about it, then that if there is a, there are so many rules in system, 6,400 rules are already there in system, right? We will come one, we'll just start filtering things. But then the idea of this business rule is, first of all, understand this, this is a server side scripting, which means anything which happens in database in the backend, then only this behavior uh, is important. Otherwise, you don't control uh, your forms and fields using business rules. You configure a certain behavior in a system. For example, I would say that if you remember yesterday also, we talked about an example where there is a SAP database integration for HR uh, and you are taking new joinees from there. The moment there is a re new record inserted in user table from that synchronization with HR data, you are you want to trigger requesting it the moment there is a new entry, uh, you just initiate a request for initial onboarding purposes. So those are the kind of things. Anything, for example, if I say incident form I'm talking about, right? And then I have kind of created a new P1 incident, then I want to I want to initiate some communications automatically to certain groups. That is where also you use. So the concept is there, there may be thousands of use cases, to be honest. You might have a lot of use cases for all of these things. As long as you're clear about the concept that under what situations you need to apply all these things, you can play with any logic. Then it's all about the logic at that for that particular scenario. Otherwise, as, as I said, if a record is inserted, deleted, updated, queried, modified, in that case only, you are supposed to run a business rule. Now let's see it, for example, I am just looking for incident table right now. The ones which are true, not the false ones, right? Now see, uh, let, let's understand few of them. Let's see this clear resolve piece. What does it say? Again, I am letting the form to completely get loaded. No hurry. This is very important, right? You cannot. Just read this again. A business rule is a server side script that runs when a record is displayed, inserted, deleted, or when a table is queried. Use business rules to automatically change values in form fields when the specified conditions are met. Are met right? Now what does it say? This says, let's understand this. This says that I want to clear resolve fields table is incident active advanced when i selected advanced then this step is enabled otherwise the step was not there and this step means that i have to write a script there so interesting they have not written a script here no. anyway so it is checked on already so let's understand how does it so so there are two things to understand for a business rule first is if you remember we just talked about that it runs on four cases. One is insert, second is update, third is delete, fourth is query. So we want to select on which operation. You may select multiple operations because it is a checkbox. So you say that, okay, if you, somebody is uh, creating a P1 incident, new incident, then insert insert cases applicable. If I am saying there is an incident which is priority already with two, three, four, I want to change the priority to one. This is update case. You can have a delete that if I delete a an incident from the system, I should get some kind of uh, error messages. Query that, okay, I have I have certain conditions and I'm querying something from database. Okay, show me everything which has uh, all these records with this particular condition. This is where you're doing the query thing. So for first, first thing to understand that there are four options, insert, update, delete, query. Un under that, you are applying this particular, so in this case, they're applying it for update. The second case, which is very, very important. So similarly, if you remember in client script, we had a behavior of on change, on load, on submit, on sell edit. Similarly, you have something here as well. There are four cases, before, after, async, display. 
There are four conditions under which you are supposed to run this business rule. Now before, when I say before, so for example, if I select before here, I say before update. Before the record is updated, I want to run this particular business rule. And then again, you can put the same conditions, whatever you want to put there. Right? And it happens only in these cases, right? Nothing, nothing more than that. That's important. Role conditions. You can also apply that this role is applicable only for these particular uh, users who have these roles, not for everybody by default. Now, when I say after, which means record is updated or inserted after that, I want to this, for example, I gave you the uh, use case where a new record is getting created in system based on SAP HR database, right? So it means that kind of business tool should run an insert, actually not an update, first of all, it should run insert and after. But after that thing is done, then only I should be doing this. Now, async is something, you know, which, <coughs> which is kind of a cute thing that it is not an immediate action, I would say. So it is like, you know, uh, it does not happen before or after. It can happen at any point of time. The client is not depending on server. So generally you have some scheduled jobs to running already, right? So it is not based on a condition. Okay, only when this happens to this, it can run async without any, it is a queued up record, which can run at any point of time, whenever you want to run. And display is before the record is displayed. So when you're querying something, for example, and you want to display a record, and before that record is displayed, you want to run a particular uh, business tool that also you can do, actually. So there is something called, you know, a uh, scratch pad object, which is what is used for display rules generally. Let, let's see if some, something changes here. If I, if I change here, no, nothing changes here. Nothing changes here. Nothing. So the moment I say async, do you see this, right? Before there was no priority. When I said before, there was no priority here. When I said after, there is no priority here. When I said a sing, there is a priority. When I said display, you have these filter conditions. No, not filter conditions. In the moment you have this, so just see this, right? A sync, you have this insert, update, delete, query. When I'm saying display, then these options are not used because display is a different option altogether. It is not even inserted, not updated, not deleted. It is just that before the record is displayed, I want to do a certain behavior. That is why you don't need to select any of these options for uh, selecting that business tool. Right? This is how. Let me see something which is there because this was kind of blank rule to be honest. There's nothing here. Let me see if there is anything which I can show you. Example: copy incident state to state. Click on and I clicked on it. Right, so it says copy state to incident state. Let's see this what this means. It means that there are two fields in incident form. One is state and one is incident state. There is a business tool which automatically copies the value of state to the incident state. And if you remember, there was another rule called copy incident state to state. So somebody who is changing incident state, he can then state will automatically be changing the backend. Now, when it runs, it runs when the record is inserted or updated. And when it runs, when state changes, this is where this is what is more important. Right now, see the actions. Now, what are the actions we're taking here? We are taking the action as set field value incident state. We are setting incident state same as state when when your state changes. This is where you have written this business rule. Incident state same as, and because there is no advanced scripting, that is why we are not, we have disabled this option. We're not using this in this case. There is no advanced here, right? Now let's see something else. Incident auto close, let's see which. So the reason I am showing you this, you know, whenever there is a requirement, you should first see whether there is an existing business rule for a similar thing already in system. If it is there and it is, for example, not active, make it active. 
rather, rather than writing a new you new rule you better make it active that is how you can do it right now this one says incident auto close so it is running after under what conditions they have not put in anything here again is it, is it a blank to you no, they have written something here this script automatically closes incidents that are resolved and haven't been updated in this specified number of days which means if i have a concept that if i have marked an incident as resolved and after three days or four days or five days i want to auto close it this is the script and again i will not do the script because this is again the scripting thing we don't want to get into right now so we want to run this particular thing after that happens after incident state gets resolved after that i want to close this particular rule So maybe just see this incident reopen behavior or state change in progress. Let's see if there is something here. The phone is still getting loaded, I guess. Yeah, let it get loaded. So this is an interesting case, which you can see here, right? Because it has all those fields which we wanted. So what it have what it expects to do incident state change to in progress now when to run this we want to run it before update first of all I mean update it should run on update but before that how it says additional comments changes state is on hold so I mean there are these four fields in incident form additional comments state on hold reason follow -up. now what what we are saying here is essentially if I change anything on the additional comment, so changes to we are not defining, we are just saying changes. If, if it was ABC and it is changing to PQR because it's a free text field, then also the should run. Second, and I'm putting all these conditions, which means all of these are kind of conditions which have to run together. Only on one condition is not working, it is like end, 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 end. So I will be like second is state is on hold. If addition comment change, state is on hold, on hold reason is awaiting caller. There are multiple reasons for on hold, awaiting caller, awaiting change, awaiting problem, awaiting vendor. Right? On hold reason is awaiting caller. Caller is me dynamically. I have chosen this dynamically. It is me. In that case, what should happen? In that case, they're saying that state should change set field values. State should change to in progress. An incident state also should change to in progress. You have an option of add message, abort action. You can also abort an action. You can say, no, this action is not allowed. Or add a message that I can give you a warning message also there if this happens. Right? They've done anything in it. No, there's nothing. They are saying add your code here. So they've not used any code to come. So we have good here. Right? So that's the whole idea about business rules also. So as I said, you should be aware of the fact that before, after a sync display, then you have these options insert, update, delete, query. When you use a sync, you decide the priority. When you use display, you have you don't have these options in hand because that does not make any sense for these cases. And then what actions you can take if you can can take those actions using UI itself, fair enough. If not, then you have to write a script in the advanced. So generally in client scripts and business rules. Uh, people use them, especially when they want to write a script. Otherwise, it, this, this is a normal condition as we just saw here, right? There is no script required for this case. Very simple use case. So what, what service now recommends is that you should be doing scripting or those complex scenarios only, on, only when there is nothing available out of the box, which means you cannot configure that behavior using UI fields and sections. So as much as possible, Configure the behavior using UI fields and actions. Do not customize by writing additional scripts unnecessarily because it creates problems when you do migrations or upgrades or whatever. And secondly, when something can be done using no code, then why should you write a code, right? Because code becomes difficult to manage at, at a certain point of time. It is not sustainable, right? You might have a different situation. You will have to update the code again, but then updating a configuration becomes quite easy because even a system administrator or a non-coder can also update it. But if you want to update a script, you need a developer to do that. However, uh, you know, ServiceNow is quite an open platform. So the real power comes when you kind of do some uh, additional functionalities, you kind of customize some behavior, especially for your use cases. But uh, try to avoid it 
unless and until it is absolutely mandatory and it is not breaking anything. Should be scripting only for those scenarios where it is really adding value. It is not breaking anything. It is sustainable future in terms of future upgrades also. So that's the whole idea we need to understand. So we have seen this platform uh, scripting. We we have seen all of these action plans. So ACL scripts we have seen on that day itself when we were looking at the ACL rules. If you remember, flow designers, flow scripts you have seen. Uh, flow scripts are something else. But again, we don't need to go much into that. But we have some time left, so I'm just kind of show you. Not find it in my. These are the ones which are kind of you know in in flow designer that you have these scripts under them in bound actions, and you have transform maps. Transform maps we have already seen. You, uh, if you remember, we have shown that that it is quite easy to do it manually. I mean, when I say manually, I'm talking about user interface. But still, there are advanced cases you can write the transform maps also. This is where you have script includes. Now this is where service now generally have a lot of things in script includes. So, system definition. So most of these menus, uh, whatever we're talking about, whether it is client policy script or whatever, it is in the script pool. So if you are changing anything on a script pool, then it is a pure customization. To be honest, you should definitely avoid doing something in a script include, unless and until you are absolutely clear about it. You are sure that how will it impact things because it is something which is written out of the box. A lot of functions, functionalities being called. A lot of lot of technical stuff happening in this space, right? So you should not be touching this until and unless it is absolutely required. So this is the last level of scripting which you generally do when you do it in service now, right? So as I said, the first things should be UI policies, UI actions, data policies. Those are the ones which should be quick quick wins, and you should always see whether there is something existing there in system. Rather than you know writing everything from scratch and just you just you got the requirement you start writing it no you got the requirement first evaluate it see whether it is required is there a better behavior I can offer to customer or I have to do it only in this because see they if I think from customer's perspective they do not know how service now works in the back end right you should be in a position to tell them rather than doing this we can do this which will achieve better results with minimum customization. With most sustainability, this is where your role as a BA, as a developer, as an architect, as an administrator comes into play. Where you also guide them and consult them. That rather than doing it this way, you better do it this way because it will be easy for us to achieve, easy for you to maintain going forward, even when they're not around. Right. So that is where, uh, if you understand the platform, how do different features work together, you will be in a position to guide them or consult them. Right. So this is what you should do always uh, when you get a requirement. You should check whether there is an existing rule. Just try to see if that rule is something you can reuse with minimum modifications, right? Otherwise, only if it is not there, then only you should be writing a new rule, whether it is client policy or whatever we have talked about in, in recent class today for platform scripting. I think from with this, I think we have covered uh, the scripting uh, chapter. Which is required for administrators for this particular training, CSA course. Once you become developer, this is the this is the most important area you will be looking into. So this is the first thing, in fact, which a developer has to learn. Like, okay, how should I write a JavaScript? Maybe when you write, uh, you know, uh, under when you're defining under portal, you need to also know some front end languages because portal does not depend completely on JavaScript. I'm talking about a user portal. Which we had a service now by default. If you remember, right? This is where uh, you might need to learn some front-end languages also, HTML5, Angular, or whatnot. I'm I'm not really sure about the languages within. The idea is that you might need to show them different widgets in different uh, look and feel. So all those front-end things are done at the portal level. So for that, you need some different languages. Uh, whatever you do in the backend is is done by done by JavaScript. So this is where uh, Platform scripting is important. So, as a system administrator, administrator, I think you may not be writing these things as as such, but there might be a situation where you want to write it tomorrow. If you want to become a developer, that it becomes all the more important. Third thing is, at least you should be able to troubleshoot. That, okay, if there is some behavior reported by a customer that this is something which is supposed to work this way and it is not working this way, 
you should know where to go and check in system, right? For example, if this, as I said, that there was a field mandatory, which is expected, which is not, which is not becoming mandatory and client is expecting why it is not mandatory. The first thing you will check is UI policies rather than going to check in business rules or client scripts or somewhere else. You should go to UI policies because whoever has developed it should have written it in UI policies. I mean, ideally speaking, right? uh, people might make mistakes, it's fine. But then you, when, so when you understand all this platform level thing that what is done where and why, when, then you should be troubleshooting in that direction. This is where your analytical skills get developed also. And you can pinpoint the issues quickly. You can restore to the normal services very quickly. I hope the session was useful to you. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. No, look, I'm clear. All good? Perfect. Yeah, yeah. See you tomorrow then. Tomorrow we will talk about uh, we'll talk about migration and integration. Yeah? Thank you very much for your time. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.